Good morning, good morning, good morning again. Hopefully we've gotten everything cleared up. Let's check to see if the audio is operating and everybody is able to hear and to be able to pick up what I'm saying. You hear better. So as you log on, just let me know if you're able to, sit, to hear. Okay, I'm thinking we're getting everybody logged on. Hopefully you're able to see. Okay, thank you, Sister Tim. Okay, I hope everybody is well. Please excuse those technical difficulties. Uh, the computer that I have is not able to, uh, it's not sufficient. It's, it's about 10 years old. It's about 10 years old, so <laughs> it's not able. So now everybody can hear me. I had to switch to a different phone. Uh, the laptop wasn't good. My phone is on the fritz. We're just a few minutes behind. We're about 20 minutes behind now, but I still think that it'll be a sufficient amount of time to get done what we need to have done. Uh, in lieu of the late start, instead of trying to start the morning worship at 1045 as normal, if you don't mind, and I'm kind of working on the fly, so please bear with me. If you don't mind, we'll start morning worship today on Easter Sunday at 11 a.m. That way we're not rushing. That way we're not pushing the envelope because when you move too fast, especially when it comes to God's word, you're going to miss something. Something is going to be out of place. And so let me make sure. There we go. Uh, I'm glad that everyone can hear me. Happy Resurrection Day to my sister, Brother Tims. Uh, sister Tims, thank you for your help. Sister Morris, thank you for your help. For all the texts that I was receiving, we appreciate you being concerned and making sure that everyone is able to see and to be a part of the lesson on this morning. So we have had our prayer. Uh, that was the second time I came on. Now we have made it to the Sunday school lesson. And so I think we're fine. Everyone can hear me. The internet connection seems to be good. This is just one of those unfortunate situations that comes along with this digital age, this new virtual situation that we're in. Uh, and so to everyone, I appreciate your patience with me. Now we're going to get started. Keep in mind, just before we start, our lesson is coming from Romans 4 verses 18 to 25, as well as Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Uh, these, old, these old digital devices, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. If I showed you this laptop, you'd laugh at me. I said, my son said, use the laptop. I said, no, that's, it, it can't, it doesn't work. <laughs> so... Thank you again. Thank you. I really need some coffee. We're going to get started. Luke 24, 1 through 9, but we're going to begin where our lesson begins in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 to the end of the chapter, which is verses 18 to verse 25. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have your Sunday school book or more importantly, if you have your Bible, in Romans 4 and 18, we pick up with Paul kind of in midstream. He's in mid-sentence. And uh, it, it says literally, who against hope believed. And when it says who, our Sunday school lesson puts Abraham's name in it because Paul is talking about Abraham. And what he's doing in verses 18 to 21 is Paul is describing Abraham's faith. When you look at verse 18 in the Sunday school book or in your Bible, actually, it says Abraham against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And all Abraham is going to do in 18, 19, 20, and 21 Abraham, or Paul, excuse me, is going to describe Abraham's faith. And when he's talking about this faith that uh, he says against hope, he believed in hope, not believing in hope itself, but it's another way to describe uh, his faith, Abraham's faith. 
You have to remember, Abraham came from a pagan nation. God called him and said, follow me. Leave your family, leave your friends, leave comfort, leave convenience, and I want you to follow me. And I'll show you where our destination is when we get there. He trusted him. He believed God. He followed God with no tangible evidence to support it except for God's word. And so that's why he's called, as you look here, the father of many nations. Father, biologically, because many people come from the nation or the race that Abraham began, but father in the sense also of he was the first he was the primary example of what it means to walk and follow God by faith. And faith, you know, uh, trusting God, it is contrary to what we can see. It is contrary to what we understand. It is contrary to what we can reason. This is the very definition of faith, to trust God based on nothing else but what his word says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When God's word said something, when in literal, uh, in the literal sense, when God literally spoke to Moses, excuse me, to Abraham, when God literally spoke to Abraham, Abraham had nothing else to go on except for what God's word said. And so that's what we ought to do. When his word says something, when God gives us a promise that we can claim, when God gives us a principle that we can stand on from his word, you can take it to the bank. God does not stutter. God does not murmur. When God speaks, we ought to take his word at face value. Now, that's a hard sell in today's time. It's, it's, it's difficult because we know we encounter people in our lives who are not men and women of their word. In short, and this is all of us, you've been let down by people. And if you're honest, you've let people down also. And because we encounter people who say one thing and do another, or they'll say one thing and they really don't mean it. Sometimes we take that cultural mindset and we place it on God. Or we look at God's word and says, and we may say, it's not valid. That's not true. That can't happen. Well, faith is when God says it, I believe it. Now, in verse number 18, it also talks about uh, um, he'll be the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. And he's talking about a promise that God gave to Abraham. And that promise, you can find it in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5. In Genesis chapter 14, if you recall, that's when Abraham took his trained men and went and rescued Lot in a war where he was captured involving Sodom and Gomorrah. He goes out, he rescues Lot, he went and rescued his younger nephew because he tried to take advantage of him and chose the good part of the land, but found himself in trouble. Who comes to rescue him? Abraham. When you get to chapter 15, Abraham has just returned from war. Lives has been lost. His feet are probably covered with blood and sand. His muscles are tense from having to fight. He wasn't a young man either. He just put his life on the line. And inwardly, he began to wonder, Genesis 15, if I would have died, what would have happened to the promise of God? God, you promised me I'm going to have a child. You promised me I'm going to have a, a, a baby in my old age. I'm not young. Sarah's not young. And if I would have died in battle, a stray arrow, somebody could have snuck behind me and stabbed me then your promise would not have been fulfilled. And that's when God reminded him in Genesis 15 and 5. He said, look up at the heavens. Count the stars. Can you number them? The answer is no, I can't number them. And he said, so shall thy seed be. That's where we get that last portion of verse 18. 
that comes from God reminding Abraham that in spite of your obstacles, in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your situation, when I make a promise, you can trust me. I'm not like man. I'm not like people. I don't say one thing and do another. And so when it comes to God's word, he means what he says. You can understand, or excuse me, you can stand and rely and depend on what God's word says. Now, there is an assumption. You must also make sure you understand his word in context. You cannot misunderstand his word and make a faulty claim of saying, God said he'll take care of me. So since God said he's going to supply my needs, it doesn't matter if I don't have any money in the bank. I'm going to write that check because God said I'll supply your needs. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's not a blanket statement to write checks and you don't have money in the bank. That's what's called tempting God. But you can get to that point if you take his word out of context. So when you read his word and you study his word in context, when God says, for example, I'll supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory, you can take him at his word. Listen, you may not always have 2,000 channels. You may not always have the nicest home. You may not always have the biggest and the brightest. You might or you might not. But through the ups and downs of life, God said he would take care of you and God will take care of you. He will supply your needs. And so verse 18, this is Paul kind of setting the tone uh, for Abraham and his faith. And then in verses 19 to 21, initially or essentially, what Romans is teaching us in these three verses, it is intended to illustrate from Abraham's life. Here's how he believed in God. He had no grounds to hope for God's promise, to believe in God's promise as far as the human perspective is uh, uh, concerned. Verses 19, 20, and 21. And being not weak in faith, he was strong in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief because when you stagger at his promise, it's because you don't believe what he's saying. So he didn't balk. He didn't stagger at God's promise that he's going to be the father of many nations because of his unbelief, but he was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And let me sum these three verses up. God will do what he said that he was going to do. Listen, this is special to us, New Hebron, and to the friends of our ministry, our church. You know exactly what uh, God has done for us. I still can remember Deacon Gardner now reminding us in those tough moments that the Lord said, don't forsake to assemble yourselves together. And here we are, just a few members going from this high school, going to the Vision Center at the Lutheran High School. They tolerated us. They didn't treat us right, but we had to endure it. And then when we got to the Vision Center, thank you, God, for Pastor C. Dennis Edwards for opening those doors and allowing us to have a place to worship. But going from one place to another place, and people are saying, well, what's taking too long? What, 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 why you hadn't built a church? So-and-so didn't build a church. What, what, what y'all waiting on? And Deacon Gardner would always come to the front of the church, and he would tell me personally, if God said don't forsake to assemble yourself together, don't you know he's going to provide a place for us to assemble together? He was literally saying, you can take God at his word. I know it looks bad. I know bank A is jerking you around. I know bank B is giving you the runaround. I know bank C won't return your calls. I know things are getting difficult. I know the congregation is getting restless. I was getting restless. But when you look at God's word, you have to either take his word at face value or you don't. And this is what Abraham did at 100 years old. And his wife being old as well. And when it says, uh, I want to make sure I read this correctly. 
It said he didn't consider his own body now dead. And when it speaks of dead, of course, not literally dying, but dead or inactive reproductive systems. There is no way that a man and a woman over a certain age, and they're in the 90s, and I believe he's 100 years old, it says, there's no way they should have been able to conceive a child. And even if they did conceive a child, have a healthy pregnancy. But didn't God do what he said he was going to do? And that's why verse 21 is so important. Another verse that is a great definition of faith. Verse 21 is a beautiful definition of faith. You can put it right beside Hebrews 11 and 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, Romans 4 and 21 say we should be fully persuaded that what God promises us, he is able to perform. That's faith. That is what faith is. And that's what Abraham did. He trusted God. God made a promise to him. God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. I don't care what your biological clock says. I don't care what your reproductive system is doing or is not doing. I don't care what the standard is in the world. If I say it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And Abraham trusted God. He didn't stagger at the promise because of his unbelief. He totally put all of his cards in the middle of the table. He put all of his eggs in that basket with God. And he said, God, I'm riding with you. I believe that you can do just what you said that you, that you are going to do. And so in verses, in verse 22 and following in verse 22, you'll notice the word therefore, the word therefore is a, it's a term of conclusion. This means that Paul now is about to wrap up his case. And he says, and therefore, because he believed God, because he didn't stagger at the promise, because he still trusted that he could have a child and be the father of many nations, he and his wife, Sarah, because of these things, it was imputed to him or credited to his account. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe, if we believe, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. In verses 23, 24, and 25. Now, Paul, and we can more specifically say God, he invites us all in. In, in. in other words, this was not just written to correct the legalistic Jews of the day who were so stringent and stern as it came to the law they just quite couldn't understand salvation by grace through faith, and that justifies you. It wasn't written just to correct them. It says it wasn't imputed just uh, to him for his sake alone. It wasn't written just for Abraham's sake alone. In essence, what he's saying is that this teaches us that the righteousness of Christ is credited to our account for the Jew and for the Gentile. And God confirmed our righteousness by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the essence of these last three verses of the chapter. This wasn't written just to correct some legalistic Jew. This wasn't written just for the Jews. It was for everyone. When you believe and put your faith in Jesus Christ, his finished work at Calvary, what he did for us in paying for our sins. And when we believe in him and we trust him and we honor him and we obey him and we follow him, righteousness is credited to our account. Well, how do we know? What is the stamp of approval? What is the validation? What confirms this righteousness and or justification? The fact that God, Raised Jesus from the dead. 
And that's how we flow into Luke chapter 24. And in Luke chapter 24, now we look at the actual Easter Sunday, the actual morning, that first Easter where Christ was raised from the dead. And in Luke chapter 24, now I know you're familiar with these verses. In verse one, it says, now upon, make sure I get this right here. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, and we'll talk about they, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Now, when we compare the gospels, when we read Luke, it may not give us all the information to tell us who these people were or who they are. But when you compare the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at least four women we know are in this group. Mary Magdalene, that's the mother of Jesus. We have another Mary, who is the, the mother of James. We have Salome, who is the mother of James and John, and that is the wife of uh, Zebedee. And we have another woman named Joanna. And it says also in verse 1, there were certain others with them, and it's certain other women with them. They all rose up, organized their schedule, met at a certain place, early in the morning to go to the tomb to anoint the body with spices. Now you have to understand this. This takes great courage and great boldness. And it also displays great devotion, courage and boldness because they're walking in the twilight of the morning and a group of women during this time, early in the morning, when the city is flooded with strangers, all of whom may not have the best intention. They could have been hurt. They could have been robbed or anything could have gone wrong. When you do have large groups of people, even for a significant divorce or a religious event, you do have people mixed in there that don't have, you know, good intentions. And so these women getting up early in the morning, it shows they put their safety concerns to the side. They were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to organize. They were willing to purchase the spices. Or if they already had them, they were willing to use what they had just to go and to anoint the body of Jesus. And they were doing this to a man, at least who the world says, at least to the current state of the Jewish uh, uh, society said, this man was a national enemy. Remember, they did say, give us Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. They did say, we have no king. He's not our king. Caesar is the only king we want. And the nation in, in a mob mentality despised Jesus. They spurned and turned their back on Jesus. His popularity at this time was at an all-time low, we could say. But these women put aside the way the world looked at Jesus, put aside the way the culture assessed Jesus. Some called him a fake, a blasphemer, a madman, an imposter. They said, no, he is the God-man. And the man that we saw hanging on the cross from the sixth until the ninth hour. We want him to have a decent burial. So what are we going to do? Anoint the body or rub the body with spices to keep the smell down from the decaying flesh. And they loved him enough in order that they were going to risk it all just to do that for Jesus. When you get to verse two, they arrive at the sepulcher and they saw that the stone was already rolled away. Mark's gospel says it this way. They were discussing among themselves, okay, when we get there, how will we remove the stone? And when they arrive, the stone has already been rolled away. Now, people, let me tell you, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. God raised him from the dead. He can get out of a tomb, a man-made tomb. The stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. 
the stone was rolled away so the women could walk in. And when they went in, verse 3, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were expecting it, but it wasn't there. And it came to pass, verse 4, they were much perplexed. And behold, two men, we know these are angels, stood by them in shining garments. I want to bring something up. It says in verse 4, when they went inside, verse 4 tells us they were perplexed. They were bothered. They were concerned. They were like, what has happened? Who has moved his body? Who has removed the body of our Savior? Who has desecrated this man that we love, that is God's only son? Who has done such a thing as this? The, the point is, is that when they did not see the body of Jesus, it bothered them. It didn't sit well with them. And I want to expand on that point. When things do not go as planned when it comes to what we're going to do for Jesus, when things do not go as planned in worship service, when the service starts behind time, when the musicians are late, when the choir doesn't rehearse, when the preacher is late, when the deacons don't show up, when nobody's in Bible study, when no one's attending teaching, do these things bother you? Are they perplexed? Are we perplexed? Do we care about the things of God? They cared. They cared enough that they went to the tomb to anoint the body in spite of possible robbers, in spite of all the visitors and strangers in the city. Early in the morning, the sun has not yet come over the fingertips of the trees and they got together and woke up and got up and left early. And when they get there, his body's gone. It bothered them. And shouldn't it bother us when God isn't getting the best, when we are not collectively coming together to give God our best, God gave us his son who died for our sins so that we can be the righteousness of God. Everything we've been talking about in this Sunday school lesson. And the angels are right there. And when they saw the angels, verse five, they were afraid. And they should have been. They were afraid and bowed their faces down to the earth. They, they bowed. And they said unto them, the angels said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Now listen, this gives us a clue. This gives us the key to where their hearts were. Remember, Jesus has been telling everybody, I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to rise again from the grave. That's going to happen. In their head, yes, he died. We saw him die. But they still didn't believe that he was no longer in the tomb. That's why when they got there and they saw the body was gone, they thought something had happened. They were perplexed. They still didn't believe it. And here they're afraid and the angels have to help their theology. He's alive. He told you he was going to be alive. He rose from the grave like he said he would. As a matter of fact, shouldn't you be in the city somewhere? Shouldn't you be in Jerusalem? Why are you looking for a living person where dead people are? He's not dead. Verse 6. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee. Now, now here we go. Here's a connection. <clears throat> in Galilee, <clears throat> excuse me, is when Jesus was telling them, yes, I'm going to die, but the son of man will be raised from the dead. And so in order to relieve their fears, in order to alleviate their perplexity, in order to calm their hearts 
and ease their mind. He says, don't forget to remember what he said. That's a phrase that can be beneficial to us. Don't forget to remember. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm going to read Romans 4 and 21 again. We should be fully persuaded that what he has promised, and he promised he was going to die and raise again, he's fully able to perform. And when you are in a perplexing situation, a difficult situation, a tough situation, God has something for you in his word that reminds you that he'll do just what he said he would do. In this case, they were perplexed. The angels had to remind them, remember, he told you this was going to happen. You can take him at his word. You shouldn't have been down here this morning. I'm glad you came because you got a first hand look, a front row view. He's alive. The tomb is empty. I'm an angel, a messenger of God. I'm telling you that he is alive and he's well. So in their case, he boosted their faith, removed their fears by reminding them of what Jesus said. In our case, it boosts our faith. It removes our fear when we look into the word of God to see just what he said he was going to do. And we are fully persuaded that he's able to bring it to pass. I know it could be a job loss. We have time where people are barely employed. Hours have been cut, layoff left and right, unemployment, and, and the employment office is even given extra money because of the state our culture is in with this pandemic that's going on. But God said he would supply your needs. Remember 07, 08, gas got to $4 a gallon, four fifteen. dollars Four twenty-five a gallon. Places were shutting down. Businesses were going out of business. They couldn't keep up. Gas was too expensive. People were stealing gas. That gas was so high. I saw a story of people siphoning gas from somebody else's car because gas was so expensive at the time. But guess what? Didn't we make it? Didn't God take care of you? Oh, you may have had some bumps and some bruises, but you're still here. You never went hungry. Deep freeze is still full. It may have been a shortage in everywhere else, but some of you can testify it wasn't a shortage in your house. God supplied your needs. And the list goes on and on. So the principle here is whenever difficulties come, whenever hardships come, and they will come, the one way to get you through that tough period, the one way to get you through it is to remember what he said. Because what you don't know can hurt you. When you don't know what the word says, it prolongs your pain. When you don't know what the word says, it prolongs your perplexity. When you don't know what the word says, it prolongs your fear. But when you look into his word, and I'm sure some of us have been there, and you may have had a difficult situation, and Lord knows you can come across a scripture that seems like it was tailor-made just for you in that moment. It's as if the hand of God wrote this scripture just for what you were going through at that time. And yes, the bills are still on the table. Yes, the job situation still is going on. Yes, the health situation is still in your body. But there's something on the inside that just has a little bit more boost. It, it has more of a pep in your step. Why? Because you believe that he'll do just what he said he would do. So the angels reminded them, this is what he said in Galilee, saying, verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Don't forget to remember. And returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and unto the rest. Well, we know why there's 11 and not 12. Because of what Judas had done betraying Jesus. And he went and hanged himself. But the point being is that don't forget to remember. And so to sum everything up, as we look at the faith of Abraham, 
as we look at how God vindicated and justified him by raising Jesus from the dead. And God invites all of us in. He said, this is not just for Abraham. This is for you also. As we look at these themes, as we look at all of this stuff, as we look at their devotion, the women's sacrifice, we need to be devoted. We should sacrifice for the God who's done so much for us. And when we get to a rough spot, and rough spots will come. You don't have to live in this sinful world long enough to understand. Tough times will come. You're either in a storm, you're going into a storm, or you're just getting out of a storm. But the storm is always on the horizon at one time or another. And when the storm comes, look to God's word. Watch and see when you go into his word, how his word directs us. I'll close with what the psalmist said. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word, in essence, shows me my true condition of where I am, and it leads me where I need to go. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall remain. And Jesus gave them some words. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be criticized, lied on, and eventually crucified. They're going to hurt me. But guess what? That's not the end of the story. Three days later, I'm going to rise. And when the women got to the tomb, the angels had to remind them, remember what he told you? Oh, he meant what he said. He'll do just what he said he would do. So let me hopefully let you, uh, hopefully you've been encouraged by this. Hopefully there's something in this lesson that's been beneficial, that's been a blessing to you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close now. And I do see the time. It is 1030, 1027, so essentially 1030. Uh, once again, I want you all to please bear with me. I'm working on the fly, and, and there's a bunch of moving targets. We had the technical difficulties, and I initially thought 11 o'clock would be a good time to start the morning worship. So I'm having to call another audible. I think we can begin at 1045. Looks like the volume is good. The internet connection is good. Uh, this is just some stuff we'll work on behind the scenes to make sure we minimize this, if not, uh, you know, totally eliminate it. So I believe that at 1045, we will be able to begin our normal morning worship. And we're going to be coming from the book of John. And we're going to look at, well, I think you pretty much know on Easter Sunday what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to suspend the sermon series for this Sunday. And people, it is Easter Sunday. You know we're going to talk about the death and resurrection of our Savior. He's alive and well. And so we have about 15 or so minutes until we come back again. Uh, once again, we will begin at 1045. Uh, looks like we have everything worked out. And what we'll do at 1045, we'll begin with prayer, and we'll just go on serving the Lord for our 1045 worship service. So thank all of you for your time. Thank all of you for participating, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, at 1045. So God bless you and God keep you is my prayer, and I hope to see you soon.